using wreckage as an example. And we make the toilet work uh, 530. Right? So I mentioned that uh, I thought there were several antinomies in, in experimental film aesthetics, and I only mentioned one, which is precisely an antinomy, antinomy, how do you say it? Antinomy uh, of uh, the, 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 the double or contradictory demand for uh, individual lyrical subject and, and uh, universal uh, um, pertinence or, or, or um, universal um, meaning, um, purpose, in terms of meaning. How precisely when, when Brackage says, I'm addressing the individual uh, inner visual uh, cortex, so to speak, of, of the viewer. Uh, what can he mean? I mean, he, he, he's not he's not addressing his film to an individual. He's addressing the film to himself or to no one. But he hopes both that it speaks to your individual self and also that well, all individual selves can relate to it, which is. A paradox that you, you find in many, many aesthetic uh, um, conceptions but <coughs> is here particularly tense because of this uh, lyrical subject, uh, subjective aesthetics that, that he asserts you know, with the, the, the film as poem, uh, the film as, as um, lyric uh, performance. Then the second antinomy that uh, goes with that, I also suggested commenting on the first images here, is uh, the contradictory or double demand for uh, literal, um, literal um, strength, literal content uh, of the images and uh, symbolic Meaning, and how how can you how can you play on both uh, levels at the same time? Uh, logically, it's not possible to, to to watch something both as strictly what it is and as pure you know uh, creature being physical uh, creature in front of you and as just a token or or, or just a sign for something else that would be more general or abstract. You have to choose. Uh, you know, either a rose is a rose, or a rose is a symbol for love, but it can't be both, or if it's both, both each meaning uh, uh, undermines the other, or, or limits the other. And so classically, when you want to, to, to insist on the physical density and, and existing uh, quality of of something represented, you try to erase or, or prevent all symbolic interpretations, and uh, the reverse is true too. And when you interpret the sacred text, as we spoke of, of prophecies this morning, uh, the sacred text, if, if you go to the symbolic meaning, you have to be very clear and very, um, uh, very assertive, uh, saying that the literal meaning is wrong. Or is not to be taken literally, and that you know, when God says uh, whatever, uh, I don't take religious examples. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hurt any feelings. <laughs> okay. you, you know what I mean. You can't right. have both. You can't have it both ways. It's like, no. And here it is all about having it both ways, especially in Berkeley, in Berkeley's uh, case. You could apply that not only to to classical. Uh, religious or cultural symbolism, but also to the modern version of symbolism in the Freudian uh, mm -hmm. sense of uh, the unconscious uh, expressing its own hidden uh, aims and desires in the form of symbols so that they become acceptable. And you know that this, this is the way, according to Freud, one of the three ways in which the dream uh, activity uh, works mm -hmm. is displacement, 
to a symbolic object so that the, the, the crude uh, real desire is not present as such, but in a way displaced and replaced. So even in this sense of the Freudian symbolism, or the extended uh, uh, generalized Freudian symbolism uh, by uh, theoreticians like Jung, which I mentioned before, uh, in this modern uh, version of the problem of symbolism in art, you have the same, the same paradox and the same contradiction. That is how, first of all, the contradiction can, can be traced from the separation between Freud and Jung, precisely why Freud uh, finally rejected Jung, and, uh, well, it, I think it worked both ways. Uh, it's, it's because uh, this, the, the individual history of the patient as explaining or as, as giving the, the key to the symbolism of, his imagine, of her imagination is one thing, and it's not compatible with the idea that there is kind of general cultural symbolism that can work for everyone and that you can almost... I, I'm, caricaturing here a little, but you can almost interpret people's dream like you uh, use cards, you know, uh, and... and Tarot cards. Tarot cards. Yeah. Tarot. Yeah. Tarot. yeah. Yeah, with these universal symbols, you know, like with the, the handman and uh, uh, etc., etc. So you can't have it both ways, uh, just in the same sense. <coughs> and in the surrealist influence was much more on the Jungian side, at least mm. in America, than on the than on the strictly Freudian sense, and encourage this kind of confusion, I would say, <coughs> between collective cultural contents and uh, uh, unconscious, uh, hidden uh, pulsions or desires. And Doug Starman is probably the epitome of this confusion. I don't say that as an insult or as a reproach itself, in itself, but uh, here it is obviously, this is the time when for Brackage, everything uh, cohered in a way, and he wanted to have everything converge into one film. It was the most ambitious film he made, the longest film he made, longest also in the, in the, in the making, and therefore he, he, he tried to do in this film a lyrical, personal, almost improvised, spontaneous, expressive film but also a symbolic film about the history of mankind and the destiny of man, and also a, cos a cosmological film about the universe, light, and elements, etc., etc., and using also both the mythology of uh, ancient Egypt and the mythology of uh, Hinduism and the mythology of the Greeks and the Romans and all these readings that he went on and on, like, this uh, kind of insatiable uh, you know, curiosity that he had, so that it's admirable in a way because it's like this big melting pot. You know, he went on for years uh, 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 working this material, but at the end, the beauty of the film <coughs> is certainly not synonymous with the clarity of the purpose. I mean, it's it's a film that is probably. Uh, impossible to interpret in a convincing manner, I would say. Uh, you could interpret it in many, many ways, but to make all these ways of interpreting it coherent and, and, and you know, making <coughs> sense altogether, in my opinion, at least I may be wrong and mistaken, but is an impossible task because uh, uh, it's, it's torn between very, very uh, opposing and in contradictory and compatible aims, uh, such as um, literal, literal uh, presence and literal um, um, adherence to to what is shown, in the same way as a painting is directly on the film, uh, and, and the depth of field is usually avoided or crushed, and at the same time, a highly symbolical, indirect, and coded uh, work. So, how can you pretend at the same time? I'm not here. I, I'm not trying to 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 uh, to uh, uh, put Brackage on trial, but still, uh, how can you pretend at the same time that 
uh, you're filming your own physical inner vision, the way it really physically, organically works, and at the same time, a symbolic poem about the, the whole history of mankind. There is something here that is just not possible, or at least, I mean, even the, it, the, ambitious is, the ambition is admirable and, and, and courageous, uh, it's an impossible task. <coughs> Even, even in the, the, the Dante Quartet, I mean, I mean, you'd have to go back and look closer the differences between the heaven and hell, but I did notice there was a much more fluidity in heaven. In the heaven. Yes, and there's much more blue, right. but, <laughs> and, and much more red. <laughs> yeah. You can look at the colors, but the, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Yes, yes, yes. No, I see, absolutely. It's both extract and extremely expressive. <coughs> and so, yeah, that's a tension. And this tension is dramatized by Brackage very much because he felt and lived these contradictions in a very intense way and mm -hmm. suffered from them. He was a very intelligent man. He understood all the difficulties of his own task. But in other filmmakers of the same trend, let's say, and a little later, for instance, you would find other forms of the same contradiction in a lighter, maybe less dramatic uh, way, or less painful way. I would just like to give you one example, because I won't be able to show any of his films today, and uh, not even tomorrow. Another example is a little younger uh, avant-garde experimental filmmaker, American, who uh, unfortunately also died um, about... Mm, 10, 15 years ago now called Paul Charitz. Paul Charitz made films um, in short he made films uh, that share with Brackage uh, the ambition of dealing directly with your nervous system and acting uh, violently and strongly on your eye and your brains, even more violently than British films. And for that purpose, he invented, he co-invented, because it's a strange anecdotal story that three people at the same year made the first film called Flickr Film. Mm -hmm. So it was him and the two others, I don't remember, maybe some of you do, uh, who were all avant-garde filmmakers in the Fluxus movement. Uh, I think there was Tony Conrad, Tony Conrad, who then made music, and the third one I don't remember. And the year must be 1960, I think. So the Flickr film is a concept and a, and a genre that is born from the observation, the basic observation of the discontinuity of, of, of the frames in, in all films, and the, the idea of using this this discontinuity to uh, to create a scintillating, flickering uh, image that would act as you know like a machine gun mm -hmm. of colors on the eye by showing the discontinuity between the frames. How do you show the discontinuity? Well, for example, you change the color. And that's what Charitz developed mostly. He made flicker films of pure color. That is, you don't even have, uh, the color is not applied like paint. It's completely homogeneous. And it's flat. And it changes from frame to frame. So that, and it can be as fast as the 25, 24 image second. It can be, of course, much slower. And it can have all the variation in rhythm. It can be sudden, like going from uh, on complementary colors, orange to blue, for instance, but it can be also progressive, like with all the nuance, mm -hmm. so that you see the color slowly transforming itself. And he made entire films with only colors mm -hmm. that were composed like music, very analog, analogous to wreckage in the structure at least of the film, and they would be played with no sound, and they were supposed to, to induce a certain state Mm -hmm. that could be close to hypnosis, or in some cases, dementia, or mm -hmm. even, um, um, how do you say it, the, the, sacred, the yeah. sacred, uh, sacred illness, you know? Mm -hmm. um, epilepsy. Epilepsy. Epilepsy, yeah. 
uh, Epilepsy, one of the, the, the most striking films by uh, Brackage is called Seizure. And it's a film about epilepsy, but especially, and that's more important, it's a film that is supposed to induce an epileptic crisis if oh. you're subject to epilepsy, and if you're not, to put you in a state that is close to the state of an epileptic patient just before the crisis. Because the state, that's it, the state uh, of your brain waves and the subjective feeling that you get, apparently, I, I haven't had epilepsy, but uh, before, just before the crisis begins, is a kind of orgasm. It's compared to, very often compared to kind of, you know, nirvana-like state, or you're floating, and it's called the aura. The oral, aura? The aura. The aura. Epileptic aura. So, um, I, I will just tell you about this, so because I think it's a good example of, of Charit's uh, uh, aesthetic aims. So the film is structured so that uh, you would you will get as much information as you can get relating to the state of uh, aura before the crisis. First, you see some footage, medical footage, of patients uh, uh, going through a crisis uh, in a medical environment. Uh, three or four scenes. So you see the patient is very impressive. You know, it's only saw at your deep crisis, but it's always impressive. So you see the, 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 the footage on its own, silence. Then you see a construction of color flicker whose rhythm is based on the rhythm of the brain waves before the crisis, that is, at the same time. So he took the brain waves and he organized the change of, of color to, to match this rhythm. So this is the first way of to induce that. Then you have a third time, you see over again the footage of the patient, the color flicker on top that is superimposed, and there's a voice that sounds a little like an animal voice because it's not talking, it's just loudly breathing, following the same rhythm of the brain waves. So it's like it's kind of you know, heavy breathing, rhythmically, um, uh, copied on the brain waves. And if you if you if you're still in the theater at the third step, because most people leave before, uh, you will have the whole three levels together. That is uh, color flicker, uh, image and sound with the waves. And then you're supposed to to feel very strange. Which you do. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea, it, uh, the general idea there in, in, in Charit's uh, work is to stimulate your brain, stimulate your senses, make you aware of the fundamentals of cinema as technique and as, as projecting uh, apparatus, that you're conscious of the frames, you're conscious of the machine. He also used, sometimes you see a film by Charit, I, I, I've seen one in the Cinematheque in Paris, and there was no, no, apparently no soundtrack, but there was a noise. And suddenly, the, the, the guy who was doing the projection came out of the regie, and he said to the person who organized the thing, there's something wrong with the projector. We hear the projector in the room. It's not normal. And uh, it was the soundtrack that is... Charitz recorded the machine and then put it in as a soundtrack. Or in other instances, people protest or are bewildered because they see the perforations in the film. When you have the film and you see all the perforations. Obviously, it's not the perforations of the film that is actually being <coughs> projected, but he filmed the film so that you could see yeah. them. You see what I mean? So in this sense, he's already kind of a structural... Uh, filmmaker that is from this generation, a little later than Brackett, in the 70s, in Germany, in Austria, and also in the United States, who worked on really uh, opening up all the basic elements of film and putting them forward so that you're absolutely aware of 
what, what it is, how it works, and how it adds on. But uh, what he wanted was not to bring you some abstract or general knowledge about cinema, but to, to uh, literally aggress you with cinema and show the audience that projecting light and projecting sound uh, in the dark uh, on, on, onto your eyes and ears is a very violent act and is a very aggressive phenomenon so that you, 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 you're aware of it and you're conscious of, of how it works. And scratching, for example, for Brackage, it's certainly not an aggressive act, I, I would say. Well, when he does it on the eyes of the characters, yes, maybe. <laughs> but not when he writes. Or Len Lai, who did a lot of scratching, very beautiful, abstract dances. It's not at all, I think, to be interpreted in an aggressive sense. But with uh, um, Charitz, Charitz is very, uh, well, he, he, he's very obsessed <coughs> with, he was very obsessed with the aggression, the incision, uh, the fact that when you write on a film, it's like a tattoo. Mm -hmm. The fact that when you scratch a film, it's like putting a scar on someone. So one of his famous films, you know, is called... Uh, Touching. 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 <laughs> and uh, touching is a face, the face of a young man, and the same footage is used again and again with different, you know, negative, positive, different colors, uh, all kinds of treatment of the same, uh, the same, maybe 10 frames, I think. It's a very short, uh, short shot. And you just see the face of this man and uh, this young man, and then suddenly there's a blade or something like a knife that goes like that, and he tries to avoid it, and his, his, his uh, cheek is slightly cut. But it's not gore, and it's not extreme, but you see that act over and over again. And while you see it, you hear a voice that rhythmically says, in different rhythms and, 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 and uh, speed, says something that is very hard to understand. It seems to be the same syllables over and over, but depending on the rhythm, you hear different different words. Everyone hears different words. So sometimes, I don't know. Each time I saw it, I, I heard different words. But the truth of the thing is very simply that the voice is just saying, touching, touching, touching. But since it's pasted together, sometimes there's no breathing in between, or you know, they overlap. Uh, you have many variation of meaning, and, uh, quasi meaning emerging from it. So again, this is a way of showing the aggressiveness and the physicality of the projection and of uh, cinema as as a, uh, projected light an inscription also on the, on the film. So uh, why did I say all that? Because Charitz, in his way, was uh, tormented, but probably less tormented. He was divided, let's say, between two attitudes and two ambitions for his films. And this is also visible in the reception of his work, because his work has been interpreted in very various ways, but the, the, the first uh, uh, famous reading of his work was uh, by uh, Rosalind Krauss. Oh, well, you know who Rosalind Krauss is? Yeah. Founding uh, 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 member of uh, the, the, the magazine October and disciple of, of uh, Clement Greenberg. So this kind of very classical modernist aesthetics, American aesthetics. You all know about that? Mm -hmm. right. Right. So she wrote an article on Charit, uh, uh taking him as an example of a modernist, late modernist, but still modernist artist who would um, open the form of cinema by 
separating and showing in all its clarity uh, the different and basic elements of sitting. So pure color, pure rhythm, uh, the film as such, as a material, uh, you know, uh, transparent. So, and it's true that Charitz also did a lot of installation so that you could, you could see in a museum the whole machinery with the stripe of the film going, you know, in long, uh, labyrinthic um, um, trajectory and uh, with uh, loops and all kinds of you know, technical ways of showing for, for extremely large screens that would be just suppose like three screens with three different color filters. So it, it could seem like this cold and even cerebral analytical approach to cinema uh, to, to, uh, to um, he said that demontade machine, you know, when you take all the parts to analyze how it functions. And that's how Rosalind Krauss presented his work. But strangely enough, in her article, she only mentions the films that have no figure, no characters, no uh, figurative content, and no uh, actual um, uh, recorded images. So she only takes you know, what, what uh, suits her interpretation and sets aside all the rest. Whereas Charitz is, is much more ambiguous than that because he, he did this kind of look, modernist looking film, but at the same time he did all, all these films like Touching and others with uh, images of, of, of dangerous objects or um, a film with words, one of the most beautiful work, uh, films called Word Movie, and it's not a structuralist film in any way. Uh, and some have, or seem to have, a very strong, even pathetic uh, contempt, expressive and strongly charged with emotion, which is not at all what the uh, Krauss uh, article suggests. And precisely in this, I, I got interested in this, this <coughs> ambiguity, and I looked into his interviews and, and the way he himself commented his film, and it's very interesting to see that he comments his film more like someone would comment almost, you know, in a naive, uh, subjective, diary-like way, uh, uh, something you're doing, like, you know, I was depressed, so I did this film because I didn't know what to do, and <laughs> all my rage and, 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 and you know, and my, and my hatred of, of uh, modern city where I lived, I put in the film, and then, but then when I watched it, it seemed to me a little more joyous, so I changed it. So he describes his film in a very sentimental, psychological, expressive way, which doesn't fit at all the idea of a modernist, late modernist artist. And I think he oscillated between the two positions, so that at the same time, he was doing something discursive, even pedagogical, and he could present it that and justify it that way. Say you know that these are important work because they show you how you know the, the, the perception of color works in time and at what speed you can identify a color and how one influences the other if it's longer or shorter etc. All these formal, uh, general, universal principles. But at the same time, he was doing lyrical films exactly in the sense of Brackage, that is films that would simply you know discharge uh, strong pulsions, emotions fears um, and, and, and all kinds of um, uh, irrational uh, impulses. Um, and so on the, on the plane, on the philosophical plane of the aesthetic uh, coherency of such a, such a endeavor, it's very problematical because how can you at the same time uh, do the work that is supposed to demonstrate universal uh, truth about the medium and about the interaction between the brains and the optic nerves, etc. And at the same time, uh, this work would express, you know, your, your uh, psychic state and, and, and how you, you know, and what you thought of the, of the Vietnam War and uh, how you were disgusted by commercials or by television or uh, how, what you thought of uh, publicity, and but this is what this was all together in, in 
Shabbos. And in his interviews, it's very clear that it's on both levels or alternating, you know, one attitude or the other.